Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us at The Telegraph and for staying uh, with us uh, that late. Uh, so my name is Hervé. Uh, I work here at The Telegraph as a data scientist. Uh, I don't want to give you a long intro about what we're doing because you're guessing it, but uh, yeah, we have an internal team of uh, today's seven data scientists. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with the business in all of the different areas of the business. So as you can imagine, we also do natural language processing. Uh, as a newspaper, we have a lot of text data, and that's one of uh, the areas where we first started to use uh, TensorFlow. Uh, but today, I want to talk about a slightly different topic. I want to talk about recommender systems. Uh, we will see, and I will try at the end of the presentation uh, to touch some of the aspect of where uh, TensorFlow is helping us on that project as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's, let's start. Uh, so why a talk about uh, recommender systems? Uh, well, one of the well, they, they are they are everywhere. I, I mean, today, whatever, when, whenever you're going on the internet, uh, when you go on the internet uh, for leisure and you want to consume a TV program, you go on Netflix. Uh, the program, the, the basically recommender systems are used in the background to choose and try to influence uh, what you will watch. Uh, when you go shopping, uh, you go on Amazon, once again, recommendations are there to try to bring you where Amazon wants you to go. Uh, come on the Telegraph, we also have uh, recommendations, so really everywhere. And these are the obvious ones, but there are plenty of uh, recommender system which are kind of hidden and people you know struggle to identify them uh, think about uh, jobs if i go to linkedin a recommender system will try to push me to another company uh, dating you know everywhere everywhere recommender system so i thought that was an interesting topic to cover and as well uh, as a data scientist working on the telegraph we are building a recommender system so we start to develop experience in that field so well, the two obvious one, uh, but what is impressive here is uh, the scale of it. So 75% of what uh, people are watching on Netflix is the result of people following a recommendation, 75%. Uh, on Amazon, it's 35%. Uh, it doesn't look big, but thinking about it, usually when I go on Amazon, it means that I have you know, some, something in mind and I go there to buy something that I've decided to buy before I go on the site, but still, Amazon, you know, is managing to grab my attention and 35% of the transaction uh, generated on Amazon are derived from uh, recommendations. Uh, those numbers are actually uh, quite old. So it's 2013. Uh, well, it is coming from a 2013 uh, paper. Uh, so it might be that today, you know, it's even, uh, we are even higher than that. Uh, well, now, so recommenders everywhere, uh, you've heard of the risk and you've read of the risk. And, uh, you know, as in the previous uh, talk, so everyone you're talking about something happening in the world of uh, technology and people, you know, and, and the media, the press is pretty good at, you know, resurfacing uh, all of the problem which might be coming uh, uh, with, with, with those recommendations. And now when we talk about uh, recommender systems, and especially for us as a publisher, as a news organization, uh, people are worried about uh, the problem of uh, the echo chamber and, and the filter bubble. So that idea that uh, I have you know, my opinions and the role of a news organization should be to enlar enlarge my views and to try to bring me uh, you know, contrast and, and, and show me that you know, articles and stories that would help me you know, to, to challenge uh, my personal uh, opinions. Uh, so now what people are, are worried about is, you know, the fact that if more and more, as we've seen the numbers earlier, of what I'm consuming on the internet is coming uh, from the influence of recommended system, so basically it's only reinforcing uh, my, my opinion. And, uh, well, there is uh, an interesting reflection here, obviously, to, to have, but uh, I think we have to keep, and, and especially for us as a, as a publisher, so we are using recommender systems and we try to optimize uh, the traffic on our websites by using those tools. Uh, but now, obviously, a big uh, part is also you know, given to human being and the role of the editor. And 
so it's, it's a matter of, of, of balance. And I think those discussions you know, have to happen, and especially in organizations like ours. Uh, so there is uh, potential for a risk, but I mean, we also have uh, you know, the tools and the, responsibility and the responsible people who are there, which are supposed to, to help with that. Uh, I think we are sharing <laughs> a slide here. Um, maybe uh, when we talk about uh, recommended system, well, we've been talking today about uh, TensorFlow. So TensorFlow uh, is mainly used uh, to work on uh, deep learning problems. We can do more with TensorFlow, obviously, because uh, that's a framework in which uh, we can do all, all, all sorts of uh, computations. Uh, but uh, yeah, deep learning made uh, TensorFlow popular. Uh, so now deep learning is a part of machine learning, which is also a part of AI. Uh, what I want, what I, my approach on that slide was slightly different uh, from the one before, uh, because when we talk about recommended system, people don't know exactly where it's fitting, and people, you know, have heard all of those terms. They've heard about uh, artificial intelligence. They've heard about machine learning. They've heard about deep learning. Sometimes they're a little bit scared about, you know, some of the problems we've been uh, talking about uh, earlier, but actually. Uh, the message here is some of those elements are quite old. And for example, when you come to AI, we haven't waited, you know, until uh, what happened over the last years and, you know, the, the very, uh, well, push uh, that is today happening in deep learning uh, to start working with AI. So in the 1970s, uh, people were building expert systems and already some of the questions about AI was there, uh, different level, different problems, but you know, AI is not something new. Then you go into machine learning, same stories. So uh, the, the idea of uh, computer learning from data, uh, 1959, it starts you know, to be something, and I think the first mention of uh, machine learning is 1959. Uh, logistic regression, which is still you know, one of the core elements of, uh, of all of the machine learning. And uh, what we discussed earlier, what we've seen, you know, the, the basic uh, element of a neural network. So at the core, the simplest form of a neural network is basically a logistic regression element. So those elements are coming from the 1950s. And uh, then the deep learning, which is really the one which today, you know, is bringing us, we, we've seen, you know, the power of, of deep learning and the image recognition and stuff. But, but once again, uh, artificial neural networks uh, st started to be developed in the 1940s. So, you know, it took quite a while to, to come where we are. And uh, obviously today, with uh, the combination of, of, of many elements, but mainly uh, the processing power that we have, some of the tools we have, like uh, the, the framework we've seen earlier, uh, mean that today we really have the possibility to, to build deeper and more complex neural nets. And uh, the power of those neural nets has nothing to, to compare with what we had in those early age. And actually for, for um, AI, People are talking about the AI winter, uh, which is a period of time where not much happened. Because uh, in the 1940s, many of those ideas were, you know, the math behind all of those uh, models we're talking about today was already available and it was there. But because the processing power was missing, um, people, you know, stopped the research and, and the industries were not interested into that because it was kind of, you know, crazy. Uh, people in the labs thinking about uh, developing AI, but actually it was not possible to take that out of the lab and scale it and, and make it available for developers like, like us. And uh, it's then probably in the 80s uh, with Jeff Hinton work um, on uh, the backpropagation uh, algorithm, which allow us today to train very, very complex deep learning models. Uh, that work, which and, and also, uh, as, as already said, uh, explosion of processing power. So it's only you know since that period that we had a revival of uh, deep learning, and today you know, uh, well, the world where everyone is going crazy about deep learning, maybe you know sometimes in, in some extremes because, uh, well, all of that, all of those building blocks, you know, machine learning is more than uh, uh, than uh, purely uh, deep learning, and AI is more than that. And we tend to forget you know, all, of, all of the learning of the past and only focusing on the new stuff. So we are lucky here tonight because we are talking about recommended systems. And recommended systems are actually you know, using elements from all of those layers. And it's not because I cannot draw properly that it's even uh, you know, going 
outside of the AI uh, circle. Uh, but I think for us, that's important. And also, you know, when we're having that little discussion about uh, all of those phenomenon of filter bubbles. So here, when we do recommend a system, you know, at the Telegraph, uh, on, we also have a place for human-created recommendation. So our editors are part of the equation. So, you know, the first level of, uh, of uh, recommendation is a human being decided about what is important to inform the public. So that's one element which is not even, you know, machine driven. And then uh, we've been experimenting with, with everything. So we have recommender systems which are kind of rule based systems. So that would be, you know, the old school AI. Um, we have a lot of machine learning, obviously, traditional machine learning. And today we are playing more and more with uh, deep learning. So more details about the approaches uh, of that we are using and, uh, well, basically what, what's available in the field of, uh, of, uh, of content recommendation. Uh, there are two big families of recommender systems. Uh, there are three columns on my slide, but I will explain. So the two families are collaborative filtering and content-based uh, recommendations. Uh, collaborative filtering is the idea where uh, you learn the preferences of a user by analyzing uh, the interaction or the ratings a user had on a different element of content. And then basically uh, users which have been giving the same ratings on similar content, you assume that they have the same preferences. And in terms of building recommendations, what you will start to do is you will find, so in my example here, user one had high um, liked uh, story one and story two, user, user two liked story one and story two as well, and we know that uh, user one read story four, so what we will do is uh, recommend story four for user two. And you know, you start building those big matrices and uh, you manage to, to hence uh, build your recommendations. Um, and, and the kind of recommendations you're getting by those systems are the typical uh, people like you also boat. So you will find that on Amazon, on, uh, Amazon and uh, many uh, commercial websites. Uh, Content-based recommendation, it's a very different approach. So there you analyze the meaning of your content. So something, uh, well, quite, quite specific to the world of, uh, of uh, journalism where we have a lot of uh, text and a lot of content. So what, what, what we're doing here is we use natural language processing to automatically extract the meaning from each of the articles we publish on the site. And when we try to, to do uh, a content-based uh, recommendation, we, tr we try to retrieve an article which has a meaning closely related to the meaning of the article you are currently reading. I'm showing you here an example of, uh, well, the New York Times website, uh, where they have an article, an article about one China, not, cinema and basically you see recommendations on content which are related in terms of, uh, of the meaning. The third one I'm showing you is it's a form of collaborative filtering but uh, it's something we are trying to apply here. It's, it's, it's slightly different to the pure um, collaborative filtering because here what we're doing in terms of learning the preferences of the users, we count uh, the consumption a user is having of uh, different categories and different type of contents. Uh, so in the example here of uh, Netflix, uh, it would be you count how many movies the user has been viewing in uh, action and adventure, uh, in thrillers and different categories. And based on that, you start to draw a profile about the user. So you're learning the preferences of the users by simply counting how many films in each of the categories the user has been watching. And then based on that, you can infer content of, uh, of interest. So that's also something that we are uh, applying here. Uh, well, now the big question is, okay, you know how to do recommendation based on collaborative filtering, you know to, how to do recommendation on a content, so why so many recommenders and uh, why, why, why do we need uh, more than one actually? Well. As we've seen earlier, they all work very differently and uh, they will be promoting very, very different behaviors. And also they wouldn't work in the same situation. So if I come back in the world of uh, 
newspaper, uh, we've seen that we have content-based recommendations. And I told you that content-based recommendation is giving me recommendations for articles which are pretty similar to the one I'm currently reading. So if I take a simple example, if I'm reading a story about uh, Trump and uh, the problem at uh, the Mexican border, uh, NLP will be pretty good at retrieving other articles talking exactly about the same topic. So you will recommend me a first article, well, that's okay. A second one, I'm bored. A third one, I stop reading. And you know, pretty quickly, I'm saturated because all of those articles are so similar that I don't want to read 10 of them. So that's where you introduce other form of, uh, of recommendations. And for example, collaborative filtering is bringing a lot of surprise so we call that serendipity uh, to the recommendations because it's no longer based on the piece of content only, but it's also based on the interaction other people had with uh, the piece of content. So it's kind of, yes, people who were interested in that article went somewhere else, and that somewhere else might be quite surprising for me. So that element of surprise is actually quite interesting to exploit in some uh, instances. But now when we think about what you're doing, and what is your objective as an organization, you can have a strategy about that. So for example, when I have a mid-article recommendation, so I start you know, reading a first paragraph, second paragraph, and then I have a link in the middle, an insertion in the middle of that article. I want you know, that kind of recommendation to be for a story which is closely related to the one I'm reading. You don't want you know, to, to interrupt my flow and you know, distract me with something too surprising. So on that kind of recommendation, you go rather for something quite narrow. Now, when you have a box on the website, let's say on the, you know, on the rail, on the, on the right of the website, as we have on, the, on, our, on our newspaper, there you, know, you have more plus play space for surprise. And uh, yes, you want to, to try to attract my attention, but it might be you know, a topic I'm not even thinking about. I'm currently reading uh, a story about politics and you, know, you will try to bring me to entertainment or you know, something that might be difficult for me to, to quite immediately understand, but could be of interest to me. And uh, so once again, the, 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 the right combination of, um, of recommender will depend on the type of content. Uh, am I reading a story about sports where we have some specific constraints? So. Uh, for example, if, you, if I'm currently watching the, the Football World Cup uh, uh, and you start recommending, uh, recommending me stories uh, which are serving the results of the past World Cup, well, that might be you know, something I'm not interested in. Uh, if, if I'm reading a piece of content which is more evergreen, as we call them, so let's say if I'm reading a piece of content about gardening and you're serving me a story about you know, a recommendation on what to plant at this time of the year, which has been written two years ago, that content might still be quite relevant for me today. Then the user journey. Uh, when, when you are on the page, I already know some information about you. Uh, you, have your, you could be an anonymous user, but still you have a cookie. And I know if it's your first visit or if you are a regular reader. So if you are on a first visit, I don't know many things about you, and maybe you know, my strategy could be to serve you a list of the most popular articles at the moment on the site. If you are a, a, someone coming regularly on the site, we know that that approach wouldn't work because there is a high probability that you, are, you have already read uh, that stories. So once again, you know, a combination of content, journey, and objectives uh, should tell you uh, what recommender to use. Now, uh, an interesting topic, and uh, not so many people are talking about it, because when it comes to the question on how to evaluate how good the recommender system uh, are built is, uh, people tend to stick to the um, click-through rate uh, metrics. So I'm showing you a recommendation. Are people clicking on the recommendation? Yes, no. Well, that's a way to, to evaluate the accuracy of, the, of uh, the recommender, but actually there is more than that. And we know that there are tricks to you know, inflate accuracy. So I could attract you with light you know, topics, uh, celebrities, and you know, the, 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 there are a list of topics where, which I could use to artificially uh, attract you and, and, and inflate my CTR. But it's not necessarily something that I want to do as, as you know, a brand like ours. Uh, 
you don't want to compromise on the quality of what you are serving for that purpose. So then all of those other metrics are coming into play and uh, you can start, you know, based on your objective to decide for which one you want to, to optimize. Uh, for example, newspaper novelty could be a new one. Do I want, you know, to serve stories which have not been written by many people? So that would be, you know, trying to surface those. Coverage, uh, are there corner of my site where I have less traffic and am I promoting for that? Uh, diversity, ensuring that uh, if I'm coming to the site on a regular basis, I'm not receiving the same recommendation regularly. So plenty of elements we can, uh, we can play with there. Um, now, coming back slightly to what we discussed earlier and talking about one of the elements that we have behind the recommendation system, uh, I wanted you know, to bring it back to the, to, the, to the topic of tonight, which is uh, TensorFlow and, and well, machine learning, uh, TensorFlow and, and, and deep learning. So, to do so, um, I, I won't lie to you, we don't have currently, we are not currently working uh, in, in production or you know, advanced development on any recommender which are relying, uh, which have an algorithm which is coded in, in uh, TensorFlow or something like that. There are more and more articles which are published and there is a lot of research happening currently and uh, we are reviewing you know, the proceedings of some uh, conference, academic conferences and people are getting interested in trying to replicate uh, similar approaches to uh, collaborative filtering by uh, using uh, deep learning. Uh, so we are just touching on that, but actually there is one element where uh, we definitely need um, uh, deep learning, it's to extract meaning from the text. So we've been talking about uh, content-based recommendation and we've been talking about uh, user preferences, um, so the user profile uh, kind of recommender. And on those two uh, topics, we are um, actually using a lot of, uh, of, 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 well, we start to use a lot of, uh, of TensorFlow. So um, one of the problems we have with our content, uh, until now, a journalist was uh, writing uh, an article and we were giving them the opportunity to freely uh, give tags to the, to the article written. And obviously those people uh, know how to write, they are very creative, and they tend to generate new tags every time they're writing a piece of, uh, of content. And uh, we did an analysis a couple of years ago, I think, or a year ago, uh, and, and we, we followed the, the stories written around uh, Pokemon Go. So at that time, you know, we had dozens of articles tagged with Pokemon Go. And then we started to have a reflection about how useful is that, because if I want to link that to uh, video games from the past or from the from today, well, Pokemon Go is not helping me at all. Uh, and, and there are plenty of uh, elements like that where the tags, you know, are spiking over a short period of time and then they're no longer used. And what we're trying here to do is basically to retrieve relevant uh, content for our users. So we t what we're trying to do today is to automatically, well, first of all, we, we want to build a curated list of uh, topics that we can build in a way where, uh, well, persistence over time is, is, well, we can guarantee that uh, they, will, they will be there for uh, you know, a long period of time. So by organizing all of the tags in a, in a hierarchy, so for example, if instead of using Pokemon Go, I'm using video game or maybe uh, mobile games, you know, I, I come, at a level in the hierarchy where I'm sure that, you know, even if Pokemon Go is no longer used in two years, uh, video games will still be there or mobile games will still be there. So we came with that list of, um, of, of themes or topic which should ensure persistence over time. And then basically we're using uh, machine learning to automatically annotate, um, to automatically annotate uh, the articles. And that piece of information is an extra element that we have, an extra piece of information that we have about each of our uh, articles. So how, how we do that? So today uh, we have that list of uh, 108 topics. And uh, as an input, we have uh, our raw articles. So as discussed uh, earlier, 
uh, by, by Lawrence, uh, what you need to do first is to extract features from, uh, from your text. Uh, so here, we are relying on, uh, on an algorithm. Uh, well, we, we're relying on word embeddings, and one of the m most famous uh, algorithm to extract word embeddings from text is uh, actually Word2Vec, uh, which has been developed uh, as the PhD uh, um, um, research of, uh, of one of our your colleagues uh, <laughs> at Google. And uh, so what we're doing uh, here, we, we t well, basically what are the embeddings? So there, there are different ways of extracting uh, meaning from an article. So the traditional way uh, were used on uh, frequencies of words in the article. So you start, you take the vocabulary, a list of say, uh, I don't know, 10,000 words, and you build a vector for each article which is counting the frequency of each of the 10,000 words. So a lot of the traditional uh, NLP was based on that principle of counting the frequency of words. Uh, now the new idea with word embe embeddings and word to vec uh, algorithm is actually to extract another set of features and to basically uh, extract um, we, we, it's, it's an exercise where you try to position all of the words in a space and you, the distance between two words in that space uh, will be uh, based on, on the meaning that the words has. So uh, the algorithm will consume a lot of, um, of text and it will start to analyze how words are relatively positioned and based on that it will place them in the space. And you end up with a vector for each of the words of the language uh, which, which has some information about the meaning of the word. So uh, actually the embeddings for uh, man and uh, king will have the same relative distance as the embedding of woman and queen. And because of those relationships, you have a pretty good um, extraction of the meaning for each of the words. And then one of the other beauty of that model is that uh, you can go uh, on the internet and find uh, the weights uh, for different um, pre-existing uh, embeddings. So what we're doing here in that model that we are uh, currently using is the first layer, so we have an input layer uh, which is taking, uh, which is uh, ingesting uh, my documents and then we feed that into an embedding layer and actually we're not training that embedding layer but we are using a, a pre-trained uh, embedding layer, which has, which has actually uh, been trained on a massive corpus, uh, which is something that only companies like uh, Google or Facebook can have access to. Even us with, your, with our newspaper, we don't have enough uh, annotated content to, to build that. So we use that as the entry into our, um, into our uh, uh, classification model, and then we go with a set of uh, uh, convolutional neural networks all the way uh, to the output of the model which is making the prediction about the probability of a text uh, to, to have a certain topic. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, what I wanted to say today about our use of, uh, well one of the use of, uh, of TensorFlow we're doing here. Actually the output, uh, some of you might notice, uh, uh, it's Keras on the top of TensorFlow, so that's a description of the model in Keras. Uh, as discussed earlier, Keras is an abstraction layer on the top of uh, TensorFlow, which is allowing you to, to more concisely uh, define a model in, uh, in TensorFlow. But basically, that's what I wanted to tell you today. So show you uh, different techniques, different approaches uh, to uh, building uh, recommendations, uh, show you some uh, elements of, uh, of you know, the, the work we're doing on recommendations, on which we are relying on, uh, on TensorFlow, and, uh, and that's it. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate to come to me.